Well, let's pray and ask God for his help. Lord, we thank you for this passage. We thank you for these amazing true stories. Oh Lord, would you help us now to understand them and then apply them to our lives. We thank you that your word is always relevant, is always true, it's always helpful, and it's always what we need to hear. Amen. Amen. So, like I said this morning, the last time we were actually in Acts was in October last year. Uh, it's probably a good idea to give ourselves a little bit of a crash course summary so that we know uh, where we've come from so far. And uh, it won't be long, we'll keep it nice and short and sweet, but it'll be good for us to just find our feet again in Acts. So Luke uh, writes the book of Acts, he writes it as a follow-up to his gospel, as a kind of second volume. It's really helpful if we read the two together, and um, the news flashes, once we're, we're done in, uh, um, uh, I'll get to eventually, in 1 John, the plan is to go to Luke's Gospel, so we're looking at Luke. So we're going to be doing volume two first, and then we'll go and we'll look at volume uh, one afterwards. In his gospel, uh, he described Jesus' work while he was on earth. And then Acts continues Jesus' work after he has returned to heaven. In Acts, we see the Holy Spirit, we see how the Holy Spirit empowers believers to declare the gospel to both Jews and to non-Jews, the Gentiles. And they started in Jerusalem, and they were moving outwards towards the ends of the earth. And as they do this, the church grows and is established as it grows. In chapters 1 and 2, the first believers are prepared for taking the gospel to the whole world. And in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, we have that very well-known verse where Jesus gives us his last words before going to heaven. He said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem in all Judea and Samaria, to the ends of the earth. And then in chapters 2 to 14, we see the gospel message moving from Jerusalem through Peter, Paul, and others. And we see Jesus' command in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, is being obeyed. The gospel is spreading. And through the power of God's word, through the enabling of his Holy Spirit, the new church grows. It's a great encouragement as we're reading Acts, isn't it? Over and over again, we had the Lord added to their number. The Lord added greatly their number to those who were being saved. And in chapter 9, as a bit of an aside, we're told about Saul's conversion uh, when he meets with the resurrected Jesus. Not an aside in the passage, but an aside here, because we're going back to where we were. Chapters 2 to 14, Gospel's going out. Go back to verse 9, and that's where we see Saul's conversion. He becomes a Christian. The Lord changes his name to Paul. And he gets involved in that mission of taking the gospel towards the end of the earth. In chapter 15, Paul meets with the Christian leaders in Jerusalem. And they decide that the non-Jews, the Gentiles, don't need to follow Jewish law in order to become Christians. And that's a big moment in the book of Acts, realizing that the gospel is for everyone. It wasn't just the Jews, but it was actually meant to go not just to the ends of the world, Jewish folk, but to the ends of the world, to every nation, tribe and tongue. That's why it's great we sang uh, those words in that uh, first hymn, when faithful ones from every tongue will one day come. In chapter 16, Paul is now in Greece, and he's sharing the gospel with the locals in a city called Philippi. So if the world was a bucket of water... The, the gospel is like a, a drop or two of food coloring. You drop it into the uh, bucket of water, and slowly but surely that uh, um, food coloring seeps and goes through all the water and changes the color of all the water. That's what's happening with the gospel. The gospel started in Jerusalem, and now it's spreading out to the rest of the Roman Empire, to the rest of the world. Acts chapter 1 to 12 is basically about the ministry of Peter and a few others, and the rest of the book, Acts chapter 13 to 28, is about Paul's ministry. And in our passage, Acts chapter 16, verse 16 to 40, we're we're going to see the Lord continuing to work in powerful ways through the ministry of Paul. 
through his apostles. After working in the heart of Lydia and her household in verses 1 to 15, our verses this evening show us the Lord at work in the hearts of some quite unlikely characters and using very unlikely means to lead them to saving faith in Jesus Christ. So here's our first heading this evening. Good news for one. Good news for one. In verse 16, Luke introduces us to a slave girl who has a spirit of divination and is a fortune teller. We should take careful note of, of this girl's words in verse 17 because they're absolutely accurate, even though they come from quite a strange place, don't they? The slave girl, possessed by an evil spirit, she identifies Paul and his team. You see what she says in verse 17? She says, these blokes, these guys, are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. That's the enemy identifying these guys. If the enemy can say that, we kind of know that's true, don't we? I always watch, uh, I love watching uh, interviews after a football game and just to see how the captain, the winning captain, speaks about the other team. They've always, they always try, yeah, they're a great team. Now, often they just say that because they have to, because the PR manager tells them. But sometimes, you know, they actually mean it. And that's high praise, isn't it, for one team to be able to say of another team, actually, you know what? We won or we lost against a really good team. Um, it's humbling. But this girl, possessed by an evil spirit, she says they are servants of the Most High God. And what are they doing? Telling you the way to be saved. One of the names the Old Testament often used to identify the Lord, the God of Israel, is Most High. Now we don't know why this non-Jewish slave girl from Greece, why she would use Old Testament language. But Luke tells us that she kept shouting this out as she followed Paul and his companions. Verse 18 tells us that she, uh, she kept this up for many days. And Paul clearly thought that she was a distraction to his ministry. Luke tells us that Paul became greatly or, or so annoyed with her. Take a look at verse 18. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and said to the Spirit, In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the Spirit left her. See, Paul's message had credibility because it came from the authority of Christ. Paul knew that allowing this uh, demon-possessed fortune teller to make these claims hindered the gospel he proclaimed and the authority of his ministry. If nothing else, she must have been a real distraction, like someone talking the whole way through a movie, especially the, the best bits, and you can't quite hear what's going on because somebody else is giving you commentary. Sometimes on DVDs, it used to be popular a while ago, where you could watch the director's cut, or you could watch the, the director or somebody commenting on the movie as you're watching it. What? I really don't get the point of that. You, the picture of the movie is a little tiny picture, and the director sat there all nice and big, and they're telling you, oh, this happened, this happened, and oh, do you remember this? It's distracting, and I think that's what's going on here. This girl is distracting the message. Paul put up with the distraction for many days, and, and Paul eventually reached his breaking point, and he commanded the Spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, to come out of the girl. And what happened? At that moment, the Spirit left her. At that moment, the Spirit left her. And notice that Paul, Paul didn't ask or invite the demon to come out. Oh, please come out. Oh, pretty please. Be nice if you could come. Just pack your bags and go. Rather, speaking by the authority and power of Jesus, he commanded this demon to leave the girl. At that very moment, the Spirit left her. If you think of a slave being commanded to do something, 
cowering and kind of going, yes sir, yes sir, so sorry sir, off I'll go. That's kind of what's going on here. Paul commands in the authority of Jesus, and at that moment the Spirit's gone. See, that's very different to the kind of drama we found in movie scripts, isn't it? Usually they're, they're speaking in Latin, and uh, they're holding the cross out in the hand, waving it around, they're perhaps uh, holding hands, and they're sprinkling water, and I don't know what all, all this fanfare. But yeah, this demon Kate out, came out of the woman at that moment. I want us to make two comments about what's happening here. First, or maybe three. I want us to know that demon possession is real and that it happens in the world today. We don't see much of it in this country, but in, in Africa, parts of Southern America and uh, Asia, India, this kind of thing happens a lot more regularly than what we'd expect. We're just sheltered and protected in our culture that we live in. Secondly, exorcisms in the New Testament point to the power of God and, and not to the one who performs the exorcism. Again, in the movies, they make a big fanfare about this guy has got, he's a special exorcist and, and he can go and cast demons out. Well, that's rubbish, it's nonsense. They point to the power of God. And we see the power of God get lost and the Spirit gets lost. Power and authority over the spiritual forces of evil is found only in Jesus Christ. Second, when demons were cast out in the New Testament, the person concerned received spiritual healing as well as physical healing. And so what that means is they experienced full healing which meant freedom from demon possession and a new redeemed relationship with God. Do you remember what Jesus said in Luke chapter 11, verses 20 to 26? I didn't think so, neither did I. Should we turn there quickly, keep your space in Acts, and turn to Luke chapter 11, verse 20. Luke chapter 11, verse 20. This is Jesus' words. If I drive out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own house, his possessions are safe. But when someone stronger attacks and overpowers him, he takes away the armor in which the man trusted and divides up his plunder. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. When an impure spirit comes out of a person, it goes through arid places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to the house I left. When it arrives, it finds the house swept clean and put in order. Then it goes and takes seven other spirits more wicked than itself, and they go in and live there. And the final condition of that person is worse than the first. Jesus is saying... That an exorcism is totally useless unless the indwelling of God replaces the indwelling of evil. Jesus moves in and that keeps the spirit out. So that means, brothers and sisters, if you're a Christian, you have nothing to fear. Demons, there's no space. Nothing to worry about. Jesus is home. You're not home alone. The Spirit of God replaces the spirit of evil. So does that mean that the slave girl not only received deliverance from the evil spirit, but that she also became to saving knowledge and faith in Jesus Christ? Well, I don't think we can say for sure, but I think it's probably likely. Probably likely. And what was good news for one is bad news for others. See, while the healing of this young woman was good news to her personally, 
Luke shows us that it was bad news for others, particularly her owners. See, Luke reports uh, in the following verses, 19 to 21, he says this, But when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, These men are Jews, and they are disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. See, the girl's healing spelled financial disaster for the girl's masters because her fortune-telling was bringing fortune to, to the owners, and that ability had come to an end. When they realized that their easy money-making racket had ended, the owners of the girl, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace for an impromptu hearing before the local magistrate. In the first century Roman Empire, the marketplace functioned as a, a gathering place for all kinds of trade, as well as a place for the local rulers or magistrates to hear and resolve disputes. In verse 20 and 21, Paul's accusers charged him with disturbing our city by promoting customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. See, now at the time, there was a very complicated legal relationship between Rome and the Jews. Rome was very cautious of upsetting what they considered as overzealous Jews. The Jews were troublemakers, actually. They got into a lot of trouble, caused a lot of problem for Rome, and most often Rome just kind of let them get on with it to avoid the peace. The Jews were very zealous about what they believed, as you'd expect them to be. And so Rome's kind of policy was just kind of leave them alone. They feared riots and unrest, and so they wanted to keep the peace. And see, this dynamic was complicated even more when Christians started preaching about Jesus, and they saw Christians, the Roman Empire saw Christians just as, as a sect out of, out of the Jews, and so they tolerated them for a while, but more and more it became clear that, hang on, something different's going on here, and there was a really complicated uh, relationship that uh, Christians, Jews, and the Roman Empire had. And what these guys are doing here is they are leveraging that for their own good. They're leveraging all that complicated stuff that's going on to their own, uh, for their own gain. You see, they, they don't say anything about the slave girl. They don't go to Rome and say, oh, look what, you, uh, look what Paul has done, look what Silas has done. Instead, they claim that Paul and Silas were a threat to civil peace, which, if you read Acts, what we've read already, there's no sign of that at all, was there? But they knew that that would get them into trouble. And seeing the gathering crowd turning into a mob, the, the magistrates ordered Paul and Silas to be stripped and beaten with rods and then thrown into prison. That's in verses 20 to 24. And then next we see Paul and Silas in prison. So good news for one, bad news for others. Paul and Silas land up in prison. In the Roman Empire, uh, a prison housed convicted criminals as well as those uh, awaiting sentencing. So even though Paul and Silas have already had a severe beating, the fact that, that they were thrown into prison, it kind of implied that there is more judgment coming. That, that they sat there waiting for more punishment. That could have been exile, it could have been beatings, and it could have been an execution. And because Paul and Silas are accused of trying to undermine the Roman Empire by sharing the gospel, we can kind of expect the consequences to have been capital punishment. We know that was the case with many other Christians at the time and later. So Paul and Silas are in a Roman prison, and instead of moping or worrying, they spend their time in prison doing what? Praying and singing hymns to God. See, they had a remarkable steadfast trust in God. They could worship in prison because they knew that, whether free or in shackles, they belonged to the God of the universe. They believe that there is a higher throne. And so they sit in prison, praising and worshipping God. See, when we have our perspective right 
on who we are and who God is. Everything just pales in comparison. And like I said, I said it's great to see some of you because I know you've come out under huge trial and, and difficulty. But when we know who God is, it makes whatever we're facing, however difficult, however hard, however heartbreaking, And respectfully, I want to say, it makes it pale in comparison when we know who God is. And we know that he is seated on his throne. If you are having a rough time, please come and speak to me. We can pray. Speak to anyone else. And just say, look, I just need some prayer. Speak to me, speak to Jeremy, speak to anyone who's here. I'm sure we'll all gladly pray for you. And whatever you ask for prayer will be kept quiet and confidential. Unless it needs to be made public. Nine out of ten times we can keep it private. See, they had a steadfast trust in God. They knew that God was the God of the universe. And as they sang and prayed, a divine earthquake shook the foundations of the prison, opened its doors and unfastened its chains for everyone. We know this is not just a regular uh, earthquake. Earthquakes don't unlock chains, open doors, those sorts of things. It might damage them and do those sorts of things, but it doesn't open gates, take away chains. And then you expect the prisoners to escape. Uh, we know that's what the jailer thought. And so he prepares to kill himself because he was going to die anyway. So rather die at his own hand than from the Roman authorities for allowing the prisoners to escape. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We're all here. While the jailer is revealed to know that none of the prisoners have escaped, he also understands that something inexplicable has happened. The jailer looks at this, he goes, yeah, this isn't a normal earthquake. Something else is going on here. Whoa. See, in this scene, it sets the stage for one of the most important questions asked in the whole of the New Testament. And if you aren't a Christian, it's a question you should be asking as well. See, the jailer undoubtedly knew that Paul and Silas were in jail because of a riot that was developing. At least in part because they'd been identified as servants of the Most High God. Who were preaching the way of salvation. The jailer also knew that unlike any of the other prisoners, they were singing and praising God despite having suffered an horrendous beating. See, he's using all these events. He's putting all these things to get, together. They're preaching the, uh, the God Most High. Uh, preaching the way of salvation. They're praising God even though they're in a mess. <coughs> and he puts all of that together. God uses all of those things together. The Lord used Paul and Silas' as faithfulness in their suffering so that they could share the gospel with the jailer. And in verse 30, the jailer asks that very important question. Take a look. Verse 30. Do you see it there? Sirs, what must I do to be saved? See, the behavior of Paul and Silas in the midst of difficulty... Uh, provided a powerful testimony for the jailer. It always is, isn't it? To see somebody struggling but yet praising the Lord. The world cannot understand it. I don't know how many times I've heard something along the lines of Christians die well. He falls to the ground and he asks for the way of salvation because he had seen he had seen God in Paul and Silas. He had met 
with God in all the events. He sees Paul and Silas. He puts this all together and it just it must just make sense. And says, what must I do to be saved? He had seen the power of the Lord in the events. And he had seen the power of the Lord in them. I'll ask a question. See, how often do we as Christians get asked about the way of salvation? When was the last time somebody asked you that question? How can I be saved? What must I do to be saved? When was the last time you were asked that question? When was the last time... I was asked that question. See, I wonder if that's not because we don't display the joy of the gospel in our trials, like Paul and Silas did that night. Maybe maybe we surrender our godliness and don't live the fruit of the Spirit like Paul and Silas did throughout their time. In Philippi. Uh, it was once said by the American author Brennan Manning that the greatest single cause of atheism in the world today is Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips and walk out the door and deny him by their lifestyle. That is what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. The positive is also true. See, many people come to faith as they witness Christians persevering through difficult times. Our difficult times are not accidents. Paul and Silas were used by God to bring the jailer to come to know him. And not just the jailer, his family, they get to hear the gospel too. And a slave girl. And so we should live that kind of witness so that we might also have the opportunity to witness to Christ with our words. I don't buy that saying. I understand where it comes from where they say, preach the gospel wherever you go and if you have to, leave, uh, if you have to use words. Uh, it's a bit of a half-truth, a bit of a nonsense. You know, we should live like that. But we should always speak. We should always speak. We should always use words. I want us to think, just as we finish now, about the way of salvation. Because the way you answer the jailer's question, it will show your understanding of the gospel. What would you answer if somebody said to you, what must I do to be saved? Everything you understand about the gospel, about Jesus Christ, about sin and, and salvation comes down to how you answer that question. How we answer that question. How would you answer that question? Don't look at verse 31, because it will give us Paul's answer. We can't argue with Paul's answer. But what would you answer? Could you answer it in one sentence? Paul answers the jail in verse 31. He answers like this. He says, Believe in the Lord Jesus... And you'll be saved, you and your household. See, it's, it's more than just thinking the right things about Jesus. Paul is thinking about a belief that requires an element of active trust which relies on Christ's work on the cross. See, for Paul, this type of belief, it is intellectual. It does mean you've got to engage the brain. See, a person can't rely on Jesus and turn from sin without an intellectual understanding of the truth of the gospel and who Jesus is. But intellectual knowledge, just by itself, won't bring salvation. We're told that even the demons know who Jesus is, and quite clearly we see that, yeah, don't we? With the slave girl declaring that she knows what's going on. She knows how to be saved. 
See, saving faith involves the will. A person's will must be engaged and respond to the gospel in faith. That's how a person is saved. Two things to add. Paul doesn't say you might be saved. He confidently declares you will be saved. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. See, inspired by the Holy Spirit, Paul's declaration, you see, he announces the positive, unconditional promise of salvation based on the gift of faith. You will be saved. Brother and sister, if you believe in the Lord Jesus, if you've put your trust in the Lord Jesus, you are saved. You will be saved. And secondly, we must understand what Paul means when he says you and your household. People get themselves in knots over this. And I'm kind of going, just read the passage. Read what it's saying. See, in the book of Acts, when a person comes to saving knowledge of Jesus Christ... And faith in him, their family will often follow. If you think about Cornelius in Acts chapter 10 as well. But we've got to hear this. We've got to hear that the faith of one family member never saves another individual from their sins. You see, the testimony, uh, sorry, the family member's testimony in their life, it is a wonderful opportunity for the gospel to be heard and believed in families as fathers and mothers and maybe children through their teaching of the gospel and display of godly Christian living people might come by God's grace they might come to saving faith and and God is often pleased to work in this way Acts chapter 16 verse 32 is a big help see Paul and Silas spoke the word of the Lord that's the gospel to him to the jailer, and to all who were in his house. The jailer's household came to saving faith because the jailer had brought Paul and Silas to his house where they preached the gospel which transformed their lives. Luke tells us in Acts chapter 16, 33, that the jailer and his household followed their coming to faith with baptism. Their baptism showed their changed lives and their decision to follow Christ. There's more evidence of their changed lives in verses 33 and 34 in the way the jailer and his household washed and cared for Paul and Silas. We are each personally responsible for our response to the gospel. There are no piggyback rides into salvation. And then we see an an unlikely church. At some stage during the night, the jailer brought Paul and Silas back to the jail. He didn't have the authority to release them. The magistrates sent their police to the prison, ordering the release of Paul and Silas. The magistrates had probably made a political decision to release them. Yeah, this is going to cause lots of trouble. Let's just let these guys go in the middle of the night. A public trial is going to cause a mess. Paul responds in verse 37. They've beaten us publicly, uncondemned, uh, us who are Roman citizens, and have thrown us into prison. Do they now throw us out secretly? No, let them come themselves and take us out. Roman citizenship was highly valued in the ancient world, and we see the authorities showing, they show great respect for Paul and Silas because they come groveling and they do what they're told. They even apologized to them. Um, to, get, <laughs> to get a government official or anybody like that in a place of authority to apologize, that takes some doing, doesn't it? My, uh, my birth certificate was lost by the South African government. Uh, let me tell you, there were no apologies, it was all my fault. Um, no apology at all. Here, they kind of come groveling and they apologized. And Paul leveraged his status as a Roman citizen with all the privileges that went with it in order to go about his mission of preaching the gospel to the ends of the earth. Paul's example calls us as Christians to steward our privileges toward the glory of God and for kingdom work. 
our money, our jobs, our positions, our uh, street that we live in, all of those things, God has given us to use those for the extension of his kingdom. You are not next to your neighbor by accident. You don't see your doctor by accident. It's great to hear Ruth speaking about the opportunity she had to witness to her doctor. So it's not an accident. You're there on purpose. Your mechanic, your child's school teacher, the child sitting next to you in class. We need to steward our privileges for God's glory. Chapter 16 ends with Paul and Silas leaving the city of Philippi. But do you notice that they have left behind an unlikely band of disciples? Do you see who they've left there? Those that we know about from chapter 16. There in Philippi, the church comprised, among others, a rich businesswoman, Lydia, an ex-slave girl, and a Gentile jailer. In Acts 16, the gospel triumphs as it brings together people from all walks of life into an unshakable unity sealed by the blood of of Christ. See, this was a blood bought people who now, by their common faith in Jesus and Christ, uh, common faith in Christ, had become eternal brothers and sisters. See, we are blood bought brothers and sisters in Christ. And so, all the Christians all over this world. Jesus is building for himself a kingdom, a kingdom of the nations, where every tribe, tongue, will declare his glory, will put him on his throne. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the salvation we have in Christ. We thank you that he's not just the giver of life he is the giver of eternal life and that in him the nations are being drawn together as part of your kingdom lord would you use us in our situations for your glory would you use us in our suffering as opportunities for your name to be praised amen